In yesterday's Big Tech hearings, Georgia Senator John Ossoff, he questioned Apple compliance chief Kyle Andier on App Store billing. Here's what happened. Let's take a listen. When again, there is so much reporting in tech press. There are independent researchers who uh, find many of these scam apps on your platform. Sometimes they hook people into paying 10 bucks a week or 10 bucks a month recurring subscriptions for meaningless services. Apple is making a cut on those abusive billing practices. Are you not? Uh, Respectfully, Senator, I don't believe that's the case. If we find fraud, if we find a problem, we're able to rectify that very quickly, and we do each and every day. So if, 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 you, I, if you identify an app, Mr. Andier, that uh, is obviously engaged in scam billing practices, uh, does Apple refund all of Apple's revenues derived from those scam billing practices to the consumer? Uh, Senator, that's my understanding. There's obviously a dedicated team here at Apple who works this each and every day. But my understanding is that we work hard to make sure that the customer is in a whole position. Uh, That's our focus at the end of the day. If we lose the trust of our customers, that's going to hurt us. Journalist in front of the show, Zed Jelani, joins us now to discuss. Zed, let's talk a little bit about this. You highlighted that clip in particular, not just about Ossoff, but really about this hearing. What exactly was going on yesterday in terms of so many companies protesting Apple and its use of the App Store? Yeah, so basically the App Store is the gateway uh, just to so many small independent but also larger developers in terms of how they reach um, how they reach mobile audience, right? So people who have iPads or people who have the, the Android phones. I mean, there's basically two stores, right, that control um, 90, 99 percent of the market, basically. Um, so their practices are sort of a gateway to the world, right? They're a gateway to the amount of money you're going to make, to the audiences that you'll reach, uh, so on and so forth. In, in that clip in particular, Asaf was kind of pushing Apple because what's really interesting is that some of the leading apps on their app store are basically scams, right? They have fake reviews. They tend to have um, you know free trials that really aren't free trials. Uh, they subscribe people uh, to things that are very hard to unsubscribe uh, from. And, you know, they, they're basically letting a bunch of fraudulent and, and like scam uh, apps lead their store. And, you know, th- what's really interesting is like it's taken independent reporters or people who are just like obsessive about this uh, to highlight these and push Apple for months and months and months to remove these things from their store. Um, because, again, this is a storefront, right? Like if you go to like Best Buy or Walmart, right, and you get a, a product that doesn't work, you just walk back and, and you tell them, hey, this is not what I paid for and they'll give you a refund, right? Uh, but the thing is, like Apple and, and also Google through through their Android App Store, you know, they get a cut of what is being sold in that store. So if you have leading apps, that's a lot of money that Apple is making. And I think what Ossoff is trying to figure out here is, is Apple dragging its feet on these things because they're making a ton of money off of apps that are basically scams? Um, is that why they take months and months of being pushed and prodded to actually uh, correct and, and actually, you know, take down products that could basically be defrauding consumers. And many, many of them, by the way, I don't know if this was this camp during the hearing specifically, but many of them are kids, right? Like loot boxes are one of the ways this is happening mm-hmm. by basically finding a legal loophole around selling gambling uh, to children, which is illegal in, in all other contexts, but uh, it, it's unregulated in, in the tech space. Right. And Zed, what do we know about how Apple is profiting here? So on the one hand, there's there's a basic cash flow question. So if, if Apple is able to sit on hundreds of millions of scam dollars for a week, that, that has a value to Apple. Like mm-hmm. there, there's, a, there's a cash flow value there. They're, they're making money by sitting on the cash flow. One of Amazon's uh, you know, big, biggest ways that it makes a profit is by monkeying around with the cash flows between its suppliers, its distributors, and its customers. It pulls the money in, and then it sits on it for as long as it right. legally and extra legally can until it then send, sends it out. And even when, and b- because they have such small margins, you know, they're making their little profit on the amount of time that they, that they hold, hold this cash. So what, what do we know about Apple's role in profiting off of this? And how, how serious are they about finding people who were scammed? In other words, in order to get a refund, do you have to jump through all the hoops? To get, a, to get a refund. And so they'll say, well, okay, yes, we refund everybody who asked for one. But they know all of the people who are scammed. Are they, are they actively reaching out to say, you were scammed, we apologize, 
here's 100% of your money back. Yeah, I don't know that they, they, they are necessarily actively reaching out. I think it generally comes after a large like public protest or public process. So there's this guy, um, Costa Elefru, who actually The Verge just wrote an article about him this week. Um, you know, he's a basically a, a tech sector guy out in San Francisco who on his free time basically scans these apps, uh, figures out where there are fake reviews, figures out where people are being unable to, to subs- uh, unsubscribe, or people are being kind of conned into quote unquote free trials that actually cost money. And he's basically reporting this as an individual. I mean, this is a guy on Twitter who has maybe five or 6,000 followers uh, who's doing this in his free time, right? And I think that was a, a big part of like Ossoff's point here, which is that a- Apple is really only taking action against these aggressively after they're kind of being shamed into doing it by like independent journalists, by people who follow the app store, by tech people um, who are in the sector. They're not really proactively, like they don't, they don't seem to have a team that is watching this proactively and actually taking action before they're pushed or pressured into doing it. And I think the, the biggest sign of that is the fact that some of these scam apps are actually leading the store, right? Like there are some of them that, are the, that were in the most abusive situations were maybe number seven and number eight in some of the, the app panels. Like there's a panel for utilities, right? Like for things like call recording or yeah. like Roku or like fake Roku remotes. Uh, right. The actual the actual Roku remote gives you a free app, so you don't you don't really <laughs> need a you don't need to pay for one on the app store. It's a total scam. But like these were leading apps on the store, and Apple didn't take any action against these until it was highly publicized and actually taken action on because it would have been easy for their internal teams to see what the leading apps are. Of course. In a store with millions of different products, they're not going to catch every little um, instance. But if it's a leading app, that means that's an app that's making Apple a lot of money for exactly the reason that Ryan mentioned, right? Um, so it does kind of point to them maybe somewhat intentionally dragging their feet here. And, and Zed, I'm curious, as a Georgian, what's what's been your take on on Asaf? This is somebody you've been covering for four years now. Ran for the House first unsuccessfully, and then ran for the Senate. Has has he surprised you so far as a senator? Uh, I mean, he hasn't surprised me, but that's only because I, I kind of had different set of expectations for him than other people. I mean, he comes from a journalistic background, right? He is mm-hmm. sort of independently wealthy. Uh, he, he inherited a lot of money and he decided to use that money for like social good. He started a journalism company. He made a number of documentaries overseas. And when he was working in Congress as a staffer, uh, he was on national security staff. So he was doing a lot of investigating, right? And I think that's what he was really, really interested in. And that's what he's doing now. I think he's excited to have an investigative staff Congress has much more power than like a journalist does uh, in terms of being able to get documents and be able to, to compel a testimony from people. Um, and I think he's really leaning into that. And I think he's, he's doing a great job because that's really the biggest power that an individual senator has is the power of oversight and investigation. I think that's a lot of how, for instance, Elizabeth Warren made her name uh, mm-hmm. was by using that power. I mean, she was a backbench freshman senator, but she exercised a tremendous amount of power over the financial industry. Uh, simply by engaging in really, really good oversight and cutting questions and, and interviews and, and getting documentation. So I think Ossoff sees himself as in that mold. And he's been very, very attentive to that. I don't think he's a showboat. He doesn't like follow social media trends. He doesn't, uh, you know, jump to, to cable news on every opportunity. He's not he's not one of those types. Um, but I think he's very, very serious about policy. And he's brought up some some real issues. And I think um, this was a great hearing on, on the App Store. I think he did, he really... He obviously came prepared and he obviously really understood the issue. He wasn't just trying to, you know, to generate some uh, cable news clips. So, yeah, really interesting. Zed, before we go, I know you have a new sub stack. Do you want to give people a little bit of a glimpse into that? Where they where can they subscribe? All of that. Yeah. So it's called Inquire. Uh, the URL is inquiremore.com. Um, and basically, the, I'm working with my friend, Sean Misrobian. Uh, he's a kind of a longtime progressive Democratic consultant. Uh, who I think has some really, really interesting thoughts about Democratic Party, where it's going, um, th- those sorts of things. And basically, the goal of our, our subsecond, our newsletter, is to is to basically, you know, as the name says, is, it is to inquire. It is to actually seek the truth in places where maybe you're not necessarily getting it from other parts of the media. Um, so, you know, underreported stories, a lot of research-based stuff. Um, and basically, I, you know, we, we want it to be really unique. We don't we don't want to replicate what's happening elsewhere on Substack, which I think is a growing platform. Uh, but eventually, I'm sure people are going to run, run into a situation where they're subscribed to so many different things. They're not sure if, if it's worth it to go elsewhere. But we want to we want to get your money's worth. So we're hoping to have a uh, unique content that I think uh, readers will be really interested in. Well, consider me a member. Uh, we really appreciate it, man. You're one of the only people that I go to and can trust on every single time. So thank you very much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, guys.
Coming up, Crystal's going to discuss the Democratic candidates who specifically asked for more money to fight off progressive challengers. Speaking with the Huffington Post, Daniel Marins, that's when Rising returns. <laughs> 